This Week in Startups is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. A business is only as strong as its people, and every hire matters. Post your first job for free at linkedin.com slash twist. Vanta. Compliance and security shouldn't be a deal breaker for startups to win new business. Vanta makes it easy for companies to get a SOC 2 report fast. Twist listeners can get $1,000 off for a limited time at vanta.com slash twist. And Indochino makes custom fitted suits, shirts and casual wear at affordable prices. Shop for your next best look or book a virtual style consultation at Indochino.com. Right now, you can get $50 off any purchase of $399 or more by using code TWIST at checkout. Next up on the program is my friend Brad Stone. He is a senior executive editor for Global Technology. My God, that's a long title, Brad. At Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg News, I guess would be the correct way to say it. Uh, and you also know him as the author of The Everything Store, Jeff Bezos and the Age of Amazon 2013, The Upstarts, Uber, Airbnb, and the Battle for the New Silicon Valley 2017. And he's back at the Amazon uh, trough again, <laughs> reporting on- It's a good way to put just, it. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's the gift that keeps on giving Amazon Unbound, Jeff Bezos in, and the innovation of a global empire 2021. But welcome back to the program, Brad. How are you holding up? Thanks, Jason. I'm I'm well. You know the the pandemic was uh, actually weirdly or perversely a good time to write a book because uh, I I would have been I would have been quarantining anyway. So you know it kind of worked out. It, it you know I just started writing my my second book and I was in Italy and I stayed a week longer. Went to the beach and you know the family went home and I had the most productive week of my life. I'm curious for you as a writer, what is your process? And and how do you get the words to flow? How many words a day do you hit typically? Take us through that. Let's, let's go inside baseball. Yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, you know, I, I kind of like to say that the only thing worse than writing a book and being on deadline and being in the midst of it is not being in the midst of it, right? It's yeah. like, I I need I need the focus um, and the deadlines uh, and the I, I get maybe like the sort of mental activity of having a project like that. And what I do... And when the story is great, as it is with with Amazon, you know, in the last 10 years, um, it's kind of it's like a brain virus. I'm going to sleep yes. thinking about it. I'm waking up and, you know, my productive times in the morning, um, you know, I kind of feel like I, I, a good goal for me is like a thousand words a day. You know, it's just it's and and that's my goal. I've usually got it outlined. I I, I wake up early um, and, um, you know, and and I. And, and, and that gives me like the whole day to kind of marinate on it, what I, how, what I want to write the next day, how I'm going to approach the material. Um, and if you can do that and stay disciplined, you know, then a hundred, you know, a hundred or hundred twenty thousand uh, dollar, a hundred hundred twenty thousand word book is is within reach. And you know, I kept right. my, you know, I've ha I had my day job at Bloomberg, and so and I've got kids, and was doing a bunch of other things. But that was the goal: a thousand words a day. Um, and when you write it. Do you can you multitask on other things during the day? Or I wonder if you're like me, where if there's other things going on, I, I seem to have a hard time getting the words to flow, you have that distraction. So if I go to another location, and I'm out of my house, I'm out of my office, I'm turning my email off, and I'm just focusing for that like four to six hour block of just trying to get the words to flow. And I typically when I do that, I can get that 1000 to 2000 right. word a day thing going and like you're saying, I, I get that hint that when you're in that zone, it's almost like you can't write fast enough, right? The words can't come up fast enough. And you're, you're like, Oh, that's a chapter. That's a chapter. That's right. a section. Oh, and, and you're just like, how do I get it out fast enough? And then there's other times when it's extremely frustrating, I would suspect. Yeah, yeah, I, I, um, I can, I can multitask, but on on different kinds of things. So this, mm -hmm. I'll, I, I, I probably couldn't multitask on another writing project. That would interfere, yeah. but you know, me meetings, um, editing other people's stories, some of my other responsibilities at Bloomberg, um, that I find easy to do. Um, mm -hmm. but it's just like when I when I'm working on a book project, that's my that's taking up my the kind of writing part uh, of my brain, and anything that would be too similar to that, I, I wouldn't want to embark on a on a magazine story when I'm when I'm working on a book project. I think that would interfere. 
when, when you think about nonfiction writing and telling the stories of businesses and entrepreneurs, what, what do you think the key is in terms of writing the prose and, and story architecture? Do you have any insights in that now that you've done it a couple of times? Yeah. A company like Amazon poses a, a massive challenge. I mean, people want to understand, readers want to read these stories chronologically. That is the way the brain works. That is the best way to tell stories. There's a great, you know, mo- there are many millennia of, of uh, you know, demonstration to that. And the problem, the challenge with Amazon is that everything's happening at once. And, you know, you not only have different business initiatives, but the, you know, the central story, which is the transformation of Jeff Bezos, almost before our eyes, from the the geek who extolled the the technical specs of the fire phone, to the guy gallivanting around Hollywood, um, retiring from Amazon and building a super yacht. Um, You know, so it, it really was an organizational challenge. How do I tell the story horizontally across the last 10 years, but also vertically, the Alexa story, the Amazon ghost story, the Indian China story, Hollywood, and then HQ2 antitrust and Bezos, his own personal drama. And, you know, you, you see how I did it in the book. It's, um, I started 2010 with Bezos coming up with the idea of Alexa. I end in 2020 and some of the increased antitrust scrutiny and Amazon navigating the pandemic. And so the horizontal story is kind of teased throughout, but there are also chapters devoted to Alexa and Go and India and Hollywood. So you just have to do a little bit of both. The, Stephen Levy, who who you know, sure. once told yeah, once told me this thing that for a long time I had up on my wall. Um, it was this advice. He said, "Find the straight line," and that's the thread that is takes you from the mm. beginning to the end of the story. So, however many digressions, diversions, or chapter or subheadings you go into always always keep the straight line in mind the you know the beginning to the end what what do you think the straight line of and i want to get into let's just get into jeff as a person um what is the straight line of jeff bezos well i mean it's it's the, the a guy it who seems quit to have taken a quick turn right i mean <laughs> there, yeah i don't know if it's how straight it is there's many zigs yeah. and zags but you know, roughly speaking, it's a guy who, you know, had a successful career on Wall Street in the early 90s, who quit his job to bet big and bet early on the internet. Um, and, you know, and over the course of 25 years, many ups and downs being written off as almost the personification of dot com hubris at one point, became the richest guy in the world built a recognizable corporate franchise that's changed the world. Um, and in the process changed himself. You know, and and became a much different person uh, and a a very polarizing and controversial figure. So, you know, yeah, roughly speaking, it's an incredible journey. He looks different. He sounds different. He, you know, some things have remained the same. um, But uh, he sometimes I I look or I listen. I went to his rocket launch in Van Horn, Texas, and sometimes I don't recognize him. He's he's changed quite a bit. Before we get into the ad, let me just tell you straight up, linkedin.com slash twist, your first job posting free. I'm not kidding. linkedin.com slash twist, your first job listing free. Nothing to lose. Okay, now on to the ad. Too many small business owners are busier than ever. They spend time searching for and interviewing the wrong candidates for a job opening, and it would be much better for them to spend their time growing their business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs has made it easier to get the candidates worth interviewing faster, and that's why they're giving you the first job listing for free at linkedin.com slash twist. They know it's going to work. Here's how it works. You create a free post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs, and you reach the world's largest professional network with over 750 million people. I remember reading this ad when it was like 150 million. My God, they're growing. It's like one of the biggest growth stories inside of Microsoft, in fact. So they focus on candidates with the skills and experience that you need. And you can use screening questions to get your role in front of the most qualified people. We love LinkedIn jobs at launch. And in 2021, we've hired a third producer, a curriculum designer for Founder University, and two more researchers. And we're still hiring for three more positions using... You guessed it, LinkedIn Jobs. So LinkedIn Jobs will help you find the candidates that are worth interviewing faster. Every week, nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash twist. Terms and conditions apply because they're giving you something for free. Okay, let's get back to the program. So let me just put this out here because I want to get into Amazon, the business. I think that's like the most fascinating part. But 
having known Jeff, not personally, but, you know, been in the same room with him and, and having mutual friends and this kind of thing. Um, did he have a crazy midlife crisis? <laughs> Is that what's going on the last five years when, you know, he got divorced? Um, he starts dating. I mean, he essentially steals his friend's wife. Uh, I think is the only way to say it, right? And he pretty much goes out there unabashedly dating another guy's wife. And I don't want to make this salacious, but on top of that, then quits his job, starts flying helicopters. He looks like he's on performance enhancing drugs or he's working out like eight times a day. I mean, he, he's just colossal. Like you've seen the memes. Uh, and, um, you know, the Hollywood thing seems to be on track as a business. I don't think that was the midlife crisis, but certainly quitting and then saying i'm gonna go do what elon does and, and make rocket ships uh is was quite a turn of events was it not <laughs> it was it's remarkable and jason you'll appreciate that i started working on this book in 2018 so i didn't anticipate any of this that that the, my my tame little business book would take a left turn into, you know, the National Enquirer, uh, dick pics, and um, a salacious Hollywood <laughs> scandal. Like, that, I did not anticipate that. But, you know, like, I'll say a couple things. One, you know, it, first of all, we can't, you know, I, I was very wary of assuming that we had all the facts, that we could know all the facts. People's private lives or the details of a marriage, sure. you know, are, are, are somewhat unknowable. They're very private people. I ultimately don't know the extent to which, you know, his first marriage was over before it became public knowledge. Um, at the very least, he made he, there was some questionable judgment in, as you say, being so open about the relationship at a time when public interest in him, because he was the wealthiest person in the world and the CEO of Amazon was so high, like there was clearly an error in judgment. Uh, and then I told the whole story about how he kind of, in some ways, weaponized his ownership of the Washington Post to attack the National Enquirer and did so very successfully. Um, you know, is it a midlife crisis? I mean, I think I uh, my my sense is that you know, he, as he got wealthier, as he became more of a member of elite society, he determined that he enjoyed it. You know, and mm. he enjoyed the trappings of of the of the the super yacht St. Bart's lifestyle going to the conferences. And I know for a fact that Mackenzie uh now you know now uh, formerly Mackenzie Bezos did not enjoy that lifestyle. She's very private, right? And and so you can kind of see their stars moving in opposite directions and she's obviously you know created quite a mystique for herself now as a as a philanthropist. But um yeah, it seems to me that like I don't know if it was a, a midlife crisis as much as it was him wanting to really continue living a life of public adventure um mm. you know or or and enjoying his wealth um the one thing the one quick other thing i'd say is you know he had the space vision before elon blue origin you know precedes spacex but he executed it horribly and i have a chapter on this in, in my book and you know elon runs spacex bezos yeah. has always administered to it from a distance and and sowed all kind of dysfunction because of that and so now we see him trying to catch up, putting himself at risk to take that flight, filing lawsuits against SpaceX. It's going to be an interesting drama to watch. Bezos doesn't like to come in second on anything. And with space, I, he's he's maybe third or fourth at this point. Yeah, I mean, in, in fairness to E, he was into rockets in, in college too. But I think you're right. Maybe Blue Origin might have been incorporated first, right? It was all at yeah. that like 2000, 2001 time frame. And they, and they would go to lunch and breakfast and Elon, no, I yeah. talked to Elon for the book and he was, he was telling Jeff he was pursuing the wrong rocket architecture and, and Jeff wouldn't listen. And <laughs> then of course, you know, ma he made some mistakes. Yeah. It, it, it's super weird. I have to say watching Jeff, um, who I think is just a tremendous entrepreneur be so insecure about this rocket stuff. I don't know if you saw that they tweeted at Branson that he didn't actually go to the right level of space by the definition that 60% of people consider. Did you see those crazy infographics? And then he criticizes Elon and then he's trying to like sue to catch up. What is going, who's advising him or does he not have people around him who tell him what a bad look it is? Because he looks, I mean, he's Jeff Bezos. I mean, we all respect him. He's done such amazing things in the world. And then to be like, you know, Richard Branson's an old guy, he went to space, you know, it's like, it could have all been like a jovial, fun space race of the summer. And then Bezos made it so petty and like, 
you didn't go high enough. I went higher than you. It's just, it was kind of sad. When you started, did you think that's just sad? Yes, um, obviously it, it is. And he hasn't, he hasn't done himself many favors. Um, at, at the Van Horn press conference, um, you know, an announcing the philanthropic gift to, you know, to, to two individuals as he's talking about the trip, wearing a cowboy hat with the space suit, um, the, ju the jubilation after, you know, a 10 minute ride. Yeah, it, it, it all struck me as somewhat bizarre. Um, you know, does he have people around him that might be counseling otherwise? I mean, when you, you when you achieve the level, well, you, Jason, you've seen this probably again sure. and again, you achieve that level of success and, you know, you tend to probably think that you know best. So I don't know yeah. if he's, is, is he, is, is he not listening to folks um, or uh, is the company doing that? Yeah, I, I tend to think that it's, it probably does come from him. Yeah, it, it, he, you cannot pick a fight as a corporation without the founder CEO's approval to start a fight. Right. Like, you right. would be fired the next day. No PR marketing person's like, I've got an idea. Let's, you know, denigrate like Richard Branson's like life dream and, and in order to pump up Jeff. It's like, no, Jeff told him like, hey, we should make an infographic that does exactly this. Right. Um, and he said at the press conference, he said, I'd like to thank employees and customers oh, for paying for all this. It was cringy, absolutely cringy. tone deaf. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, this is a good jumping off point because I'm curious, you know, we're old guys now. I'm 50. I don't know how old you are, Brad. I think you're a couple years older than me. I'm, um, I'm Jason, I'm the same damn age. We're both 50, both born in 1970. I, okay, so I just turned 50. Yeah. Okay. So then I'm older. Yeah, I turned 50 on November 28th. So we're Gen Xers, right? And, um, you know, there's a generation of journals who are coming up who are very anti-capitalism, anti- you know, they've got concerns about wealth disparity, they got concerns about the uh, unions and workers and workers rights. I have to say when when we look at um, what Amazon has contributed to society, it's hard for me to look at it and say this has not been amazing and extraordinary for society. The fact is, the best idea of the last 20 years or 30 years, uh, by the scorecard, the scorecard being, you know, consumers wanting to consume something and engage with it as a product was the everything store getting anything you want within originally, I guess, two days, getting anything you wanted, then getting within two days, and then one day, and now who knows, maybe we'll get it into an hour. That idea was the greatest idea of the past 30 ideas voted on by consumers dollars, right? I mean, we both agree on that. I can't think of any idea that consumers voted more for. And now, I don't know if you saw today, or maybe it was yesterday, yesterday the news broke, that they're going to cover people's uh, bachelor's degrees. Right. They pay double minimum wage, the federal minimum wage. They didn't have to be, you know, harangued into doing that. They just did it. They're fighting to get workers there. And you hear, you know, Elizabeth Warren and AOC attacking, you know, and trying to protect the workers of Amazon. I don't hear the workers of Amazon complaining at all. And then you had that New York Times story where they said, oh, all these people had the worst possible traumatic PTSD experience at Amazon, but you know more Amazon workers and uh, um, Amazon executives than anybody in terms of interviewing. I don't think there's a single person on the planet outside of Amazon's HR department who has interviewed more executives. You know how fiercely loyal and how much they love Jeff and the company. So what is the, how do you look at it just as a chronicler of this, putting aside your hat at Bloomberg, sure. as a chronicler, do you look at, Amazon is good for society and good to its workers, executives down to the people working in the factories. Right. I, I you know, I would not have written two books and devoted mm -hmm. a large portion of the last decade of my life in my 40s yeah. uh, to to chronicling this company if I just wanted to kick it in the knees, if I thought it was right. a nefarious uh, presence in society. I'm a Amazon Prime member. I'm elect an Alexa owner. I watch the movies and the TV shows. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a I'm a customer. At the same time, I think both things are true. It's okay. an amazing company. Um, but, you know, like a lot of tech companies, right, it's grown, it's created a platform um, and globalized and moved at a speed and left a trail of destruction and, mm. and had to account and is accounting now, you know, for some of the mistakes it's made. I mean, what is Bezos the trail of destruction? Less, yeah, right. It's it's well, there's a number of different dimensions. I mean, one, it's um, you know, creating a, a globalized marketplace 
and reducing the friction, creating a self-service system for sellers around the world, reducing all friction to selling, and now spending billions of dollars to fight counterfeits and fraud and uh, ensure ah. that the items are safe, right? There's there's a, I have a chapter on that. There's, you know, to, oh, okay. to pick so, so what just to unpack so that for a second, one. there's an yeah. unintended consequence of when you take all friction out of people selling, specifically the third party sellers, right. where they let exactly. anybody sell on their platform, which is I think you would agree, like an incredible decision they made. Um, and and had unpack. to make because because Alibaba and, and then yes. a startup called Wish were, were, were doing that. And it was a it was a disruption. And they right. had to move, qu move quickly. And, and, and yeah, there were consequences to that. And the and the, the consequence is, hey, somebody who's working at a factory who made this incredible startups product might at night run the factory for somebody else make a knockoff version in Amazon let's be honest, probably turned a blind eye to it for a while. Is that what you would discover? Totally. Or, or added a lithium ion battery that exploded into flames when you plugged it in. Okay. Um, all, all, all sorts right, so, of examples. Yeah. But that's one dimension. I think the okay. labor thing, you know, you're right in that the preponderance of Amazon employees are not co complaining vociferously. You know, they're, they're happy to work there. Um, they're having productive careers. They're having their education paid for. But we can't ignore a vocal subset of employees, um, you know, some who get ill, who develop ergonomic disorders at work, um, pregnant employees who it's well documented have, have, have been sort of mistreated by a company that historically is so focused on meeting its promises to customers, getting efficient, building at rapid speed, now thousands of fulfillment centers around the world. You know, there is room for improvement and Amazon has acknowledged that and it's trying to get ahead of it, in part because it's a very competitive la labor market. Hey, everybody, I thought I would have Christina Cassiopo on this week in startups to tell you about Vanta. Vanta, of course, has been sponsoring the pod and had a great reaction. And we're going to talk today just a little bit about what SOC 2 compliance is and why it's so important for SaaS products. Welcome to the pod, Christina. Thank you so much for having me. How long does this typically take? And what does it cost? Yeah, so in the uh, you know prior world, if you didn't use software like Vanta, often companies would take about a year on the project to figure out what they needed to do, get everything in order, work with the auditor, get the auditor what they needed to get their report. And they probably spent $20,000 on the low end, kind of can go up to hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on how large you are. You figured out a way at Vanta to do this um, quicker, better, and cheaper. So what is the secret and uh, how can people use the product. Yeah, absolutely. So secret is sort of like a lot of things. You, you turn you turn a lot of this into software. So you uh, write a standardized set of checks that a company needs to do. You base them on good security principles. And then you just monitor and alert all of those things. So the company gets a dashboard. They always know where they are. They're not, you know, mucking around in spreadsheets. And the auditor gets just really detailed data so they can be sure that what the company says they're doing is actually happening. All right, fantastic. Well, thanks so much for coming on and telling the audience why you should get your SOC 2 when you should get it and how you should do it. And you've been very nice to our audience, giving them $1,000 off, uh, which is a really significant and generous offer. Go to vanta.com slash twist, V-A-N-T-A dot com slash twist to get $1,000 off your sock too. Thanks, Christina. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Explain to me the um, pregnant women issue. I, I never heard that. I'm, I'm, I'm confused. Is that executives? In fact, or is no, it no. people working at um, factories being pushed yeah. too hard when pregnant? Yeah, That's right. Or trying you know trying to take leave in which i and I, i'm i can't go too deep on this it, i just saw something about it today i think oh, it okay. might be the the california uh state legislature looking to to pass uh, a law about that but um you know this was never a company and look very decentralized a lot of lot of power in uh in the in the local managers you know, it was never a company that was necessarily known for sensitivity to workers and their maladies or their or, or or their personal needs on 10 to 12 hour shifts, including some mandatory overtime during during peak peak hours. So, right. you know, I think both are true. I think it's a fascinating and important company that's made a positive contribution, particularly to customers. And, you know, a company that like clearly over the past 25 years, has had a transactional relationship with a lot of its employees as it's mm. seeking to, to maintain its growth and to keep unions at bay. And you know, there, there is room for a critique. Yeah. I mean, the way I look at the critique is, um, this is an intense work environment, putting aside the pregnant women issue, which to me is just like, well, that's bizarre. And well, let's, let's shelve that until we have the information on it. 
um, which would be unforgivable if true, um, and just horrific. Um, but McDonald's has been fighting the raising of the minimum wage for decades. Uh, and they pay workers nine, 10, 11 bucks an hour. You're talking about getting paid 50% more here. We got 10 million open jobs in the country. Uh, we've had a, you know, an, a, a low, uh, employment, uh, low unemployment and, and people fighting to get these folks, uh, into positions. So when you think about it, those people are opting into working there and not McDonald's. So they're, I, I think one of the things we've lost in this hyperactive press and, you know, Bloomberg's slightly different because you're a business journalism place and you're kind of old school, but you know, you see the Voxes of the world, the Huffington Post of the world, uh, you know, Buzzfeeds, these poor workers, but don't they have agency and they're picking that over working at Target, picking that over Starbucks and picking that over working at fast food places? I, I, I agree, but Amazon is the second largest employer in, in the country right now. Mm -hmm. And the rules that it establishes, um, you know, but both on the, on the downside with, you know, some of the goals that they've set, the kind of algorithmic way of, of managing workers. And then more recently, some of the perks that they've started to give to workers. Um, and, and, you know, some of the education reimbursement, the $15 an hour, hour wage, they're a leader. So it is important, right? I mm. mean, other companies want to be like Amazon. They follow Amazon. Um, uh, you know, and then there's some communities in which like local retail has been wiped out, right? And, and right. maybe they're the two big, cho the three choices are fast food, Walmart and Amazon. So, you know, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I don't want to over, over, uh, emphasize how much choice wor some workers have in this economy. Mm, yeah, I mean, it, with COVID, that that puts a crazy um, a, a crazy wild card into it because there are people geographically who maybe don't have choice, who are not writers, developers, designers who can work online. Um, let, let's go into the business of Amazon for a second. My understanding, because I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, so you're you're getting to talk to executives. I talk to people who flee and become entrepreneurs. So I want to take some of the things I hear as an insider. And then cross reference them with you as a reporter, as an insider. Um, and I think you have deeper knowledge than I do. My understanding from people who've worked at the company is that Amazon Prime is the North Star of the company and that anything that happens is through the lens of the Amazon Prime customers and that club, as it were. When you and I joined Amazon Prime, I don't know how many years ago, 15 years ago. Was, I think the initial price I paid was 40 bucks or 50 bucks. No, so $79 a year is a prime number. Oh, okay. But it was, there was a discount in the beginning. I remember like maybe 20 bucks off when it first started, but now it's, I, I think 20 bucks a month, 120, 150 bucks a year. 129, 129 now. Yeah. So they've raised the price. And if you just think about that for a moment, Amazon is such an amazing service and their product is so flawless and friction free that people are willing to pay to shop there. And it seems like people have lost um, the script in terms of exactly what an amazing accomplishment that is. What did people tell you about Amazon Prime being the, the, the locus of power inside the company? Yeah. Um, and by the way, it's $119 and a, a year. So clearly- yeah, That's my, if you pay my, by year, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, that's right. Well, so I tell the story of, of Amazon Prime in the first book, The Everything Store. And then in this book, I talk about Prime Video and some of the other add-on Prime services. Um, you know, for, uh, Bezos was, has been really good as, as he's, as the company grew about figuring out where he can add value. You know, what can he do at the end of every year uh, to get people onto the same page, particularly when you've got a company that's half a million or a million people. And for a long time, the thing that he did was in every meeting, um, he would say, what are you doing for prime? Um, it, 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 it's the glue that holds it all together. And, you know, the prime customer is their best customer. They'll, they'll spend two to three times as much as a non-prime member. Um, and, and so it's like all roads, uh, all products at the company are on ramps that lead to prime. And it's been, you know, it's been an enormous competitive advantage for the company. Like you just look at prime video and Amazon studios. I mean, that is a service that, you know, Netflix and Disney Plus and other companies are charging significant monthly fees for, and Amazon makes it free for, for Prime members. It allows mm -hmm. them to compete in a totally different way. While at the same time with AWS, they go and they power Apple TV and Disney Plus and, and Netflix. So, 
you know, Amazon gets to win at a lot of different levels. Um, you know, the, the prime customer is their best customer, and they've understood that for many years. And, and everything they do is, including Prime Day. It's a, I tell the story of Prime Day in the, in the book. It was styled on Alibaba Singles Day, but the insight was we're going to have this big day once a year during the back. It started with the back to school period over the summer. Um, but w the, the metric of success is how many new Prime members we get. Ah, uh, see, that is the type of detail I'm talking about. I was also, see, I didn't know that one, but that makes a ton of sense to me. These, these deals are so outrageous that if they lost 20 bucks on everybody who was a non prime member who showed up that day, that means your acquisition costs for a lifetime value of an Amazon prime customer is, is well, so it's even low, better. It's ridiculous. It's even better because they're not losing 20 bucks. The, 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 the vendor is losing <laughs> because they go yeah. around and they ask the brands to sponsor the deals. Right. Um, the deals are great. Um, the, the, the brands get sales and they get prime members. That's that is some like Tom Sawyer painting the fence, you know, give me your <laughs> apple. I'll let you paint the fence <laughs> <Exactly>. strategy. <laughs> the other thing I heard, I don't know if you heard this one was a, a portion of the Whole Foods acquisition, which we know was a um, that that was th they danced around that for a little while. I think you had some inside information on that in the book as well. We'll get to that in a second. But I was told that they wanted Whole Foods because they thought, you know what, we just break even on Whole Foods. And listen, they bought it for 13 or 14 billion, the stock went up 20 billion the next like two weeks. So it was essentially a free acquisition if you look at their market cap increase, um, which isn't a perfect way to look at it, but an interesting one. Um, they just thought, well, we can sign up prime members at Whole Foods, we now have access to the most elite audience. And if a third of them are on prime and two thirds aren't or whatever it is, they did a calculation and said, if we just get whatever percentage of them to get onto prime, we win. Did you hear that one as well? Right, right. I, I don't know that that was the exact calculation. I mean, it, so much of this is just fortuitous timing. And they they had kind of hit it, not a dead end, but they were certainly struggling with the fresh delivery service, Prime Now, Instacart's racing ahead, um, Google Express, they viewed as a threat at that point. And then Whole Foods is being attacked by activist investors, and John Mackey's looking for a white knight. Um, mm. it, you know, interestingly enough, Amazon's growing now, not via new whole food stores, but by creating their own restaurant, uh, they're sorry, their own supermarket chain. Yeah. Uh, the, f the fresh markets with the Amazon go cameras in, in, in the ceiling. So I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think like they, it's funny cause I, we have a local whole foods. They haven't done much there other than the mm -hmm. integration of prime as, as the, as the loyalty program that whole foods really never had. Yeah. So let's talk about the stores. You got Amazon books. They've experimented with Amazon four star. You got fresh. Um, which I think does that live inside of Whole Foods, and then they have pop-up no, stores. Different. It's different. It's different. It's different. And then you have yeah. Go, which we see in mm -hmm. cities, and Amazon Go Grocery, which I guess right. is a bodega or you Just know a bigger the, the fruit bigger. stand in New York. They've kinda. retired. They've retired that brand, but it's they the did. it's okay. the Go store. Yeah. So so tell me about their retail strategy. I'm curious. Yeah. Well, uh, ninety percent of or maybe eighty five percent of retail sales is still stubbornly physical <laughs> and uh, you know amazon wants to play there and they've in a very amazon like way they've always determined that technology can be their lever their way to do things a little bit differently um the ghost store is probably the biggest investment uh that amazon has ever made in anything um they've labored at it for 10 years out of frustration they started the bookstores just to get something out there and then the four star stores but you know now we see the the go technology um, migrating into a couple of Whole Foods, but mostly the standalone Amazon Fresh supermarkets. And I, I think in particular, uh, you know, fresh food, groceries, drugstore items, you know, it's a significant part of all retail. And uh, people generally want it now. And, the, you know, next day or two days isn't fast enough. So Amazon made it, you know, Jeff realized that they needed to be in physical retail. And so they're on a journey to kind of figure that out. How can they go compete with the Kroger's and the Walmart's of the world, or even the Rite Aid's or the Walgreens of the world. Um, and it's going to be, it's going to look conventional, but there's going to be tech behind the scenes and they're going to do it in an mm -hmm. Amazon like way. So um, I think this is interesting to dovetail your two books. Uh, Uber uh, under Dara is working. Uh, they bought a, a store called, what did they buy? What was the company? Bo not Bodega, a corner store. They bought corner store. There was another startup called Bodega. Corner shop was the Uber acquisition. There was another startup called Bodega that did something similar, but they got canceled because 
they culturally appropriated the name bodega, which I thought was a little ridiculous. Right. But bodega's concept was really good. They were putting into like lobbies of buildings, a self-serve kind of app. You, you s- use your app and like in your lobby, they would have whatever toiletries you need or whatever. And you open it up and it's like the honor system. You take out whatever you want, but there's a camera in there. So if you took two shampoos, they would know. Putting that aside, um, you had Instacart try to sell to um, DoorDash, I think. And then they tried to sell to Uber. Founder got replaced or something. I don't know if you've, you've covered that. And then Uber's had tremendous success in Uber Eats uh, and selling various sundries and you know basically connecting other retailers like instacart does to uh people you know the 100 million plus people in america who have the uber app or whatever it is now so is that the next frontier one hour delivery lyft uber doordash etc instacart competing and and do they have a chance versus amazon yeah i mean i think it's been the next frontier um yeah, for 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 the last five years, when uh, you know when Instacart and um, Prime Now and all those stuff hit the hit the scene, um, you know, do they have a chance? Um, yeah, I mean, I think like confederating existing retail, um, y- you know, you don't have to build as much, right? The, the right. products, the deodorant I need, you know, is sitting in you know two miles in every direction from my house right now on the Walgreens and the Rite Aids and the Dwayne Reeds near near me. So, you know, if you can bring those retailers together on an app, um, you don't have to do what Amazon has. And uh, n- no one wants to work with Amazon. I mean, they and I tell this story in the book. They went, they want, they tried to replicate the Google Express or the Instacart experience of working with conventional retailers and putting their inventory online. But it's Amazon. Nobody wants to facilitate their own death. So Amazon has to build fulfillment centers that are now closer to or even inside cities. So that's taking a while, right? And that's, that's why Amazon spends billions of dollars uh, building new spends billions of dollars building new fulfillment centers every year. So I, I think they have a, ch- they do have a chance and they need to take advantage of it because Amazon is coming, right? Amazon's mm-hmm. getting closer to its customers every year. Have you ever felt anxious in a really expensive suit? I know I have. You put it on your shelf, you're going to have all that anxiety. You're not going to want to wear it. I have an amazing tip for you. It's called Indochino. I have been getting my suits at Indochino, and they are gorgeous. You go to the store, they measure you, and then they talk to you about what you like. All the different aspects of the suit, the fabric, the way the pockets work, the lapels. They'll even put a monogram in there or really gorgeous what they would call like a statement lining a lining that when you turn your jacket inside out and lay it on the chair next to you people go wow that's a gorgeous suit where did you get it from and i tell people i got it from indochino they say it fits perfect it looks great on you and that's the thing about suits when they are custom made and they fit you perfect you'll look like a million bucks indochino suits start at just 399 dollars the best part is that once you have all of that sizing information They can just ship you another suit. Additionally, if you want to alter it a little bit, you think, hmm, maybe I could take this in, maybe I take that out over here, uh, change the the length, because sometimes, you know, maybe you want to do that after you get it. They'll give you a $75 credit to go to a local tailor and do that. It is a no-brainer. Indochino is now open in select Nordstrom stores. To find the nearest location, go to Indochino.com, I-N-D-O-C-H-I-N-O.com. Plus, right now, you're going to get $50 off any purchase of $3.99 or more just by using the code TWIST, T-W-I-S-T, at checkout. I have the most brilliant idea, uh, I think. Let me, I've never shared it, but I'm going to share it with you. Uh, Walgreens, a $40 billion company. Uber's like a $80 to $100 billion company. Uber buys Walgreens or Walgreens merges with Uber. Instant, <laughs> instant competitor. What do you think? Well, I mean, they're so constitutionally different, right? Um, And this is something where, you know, Amazon bought Whole Foods. And as I said, they've allowed John Mackey to run it in Austin. They haven't done much to it. And that's probably comes from a hard won awareness over the years with Quincy and Zappos and uh, all the companies they bought in the 90s, that that kind of thing takes many years and creates a cultural mess. Mm. Um, But it's interesting. I mean, it. You know, the, the challenge is, I guess, with, with, with Uber, uh, really for, in- with Instacart is that ultimately a lot of these retailers want to control their own destiny. Yes. You know, and if you're a Walmart or a Walgreens and you have the resources to go hire technologists and build your own app, do you ultimately want to deal 
with yeah. an Instacart. To, yeah. And so, well, that you know, was the weird thing about Instacart because what is Instacart's special sauce? Somebody who puts the things, you know, a, a shopper who puts them into a bag. Well, they already have those. And they don't, they, they don't even employ the shoppers, right? They don't employ the shoppers, right? Yeah. So, they're like, a tech layer. It, it's a, they're just a tech layer and a pretty easy one to replicate for Lyft, Uber, DoorDash, and Amazon for that matter. Or even if Walgreens or, you know, one of these other uh, folks got their act together, they might actually be able to figure it out as well. How has Walmart um, actually been able to, I, I think, thrive in the age of Amazon? Yeah. Um, and only recently, under, under the leadership of Doug McMillan, it feels like they have turned it around. I mean, I think one of the... I mean, Wal like, <laughs> there's this funny tendency these days to look at Walmart as some kind of underdog, right? And yep. yet, really, by sales, it still does eclipse Amazon, and it's the largest retailer in the world, and they've got tremendous resources. Um, you know, and then they had what, what, you know, the real moat was in the grocery business, yep. uh, which Amazon is still on a journey to figure out. And so, I think it was... Uh, probably the smart but expensive move of hiring Mark Laurie and uh, buying Jet.com and bringing in some, you know, some real indigenous internet people and, you know, figuring out how do we build a customer friendly app and an experience and, and then focus on what they do best, which is going to be those soft line goods. Um, you know, personally, I'm not a Walmart customer and in part because I live in the Bay Area. Um, but uh, do we even so have one in the Bay Area? <laughs> I, don't I don't think we do. Somewhere on Route 80. They would the burn it down, right? <laughs> it would yeah. basically. Yeah. The crazy socialists and communists in the Bay Area would literally burn it down. <laughs> it's bonkers. Um, so uh, wh what do you think about regulation now? We, we have um, a Lena Khan coming in and she obsessed over Amazon. and wrote, She's already think, there. Yep. She's already there, right? And she's in and she spent. And she's young, right? I mean, she's early in her career. She wrote two seminal papers. I think they both were about Amazon and how to think about them as a monopoly. How do you think Amazon will fare? And did Bezos leaving and putting a CEO in place while still having a lot of control, was that like a Larry Page, Sergey Brin move to kind of be a puppet master and not have to go to all these, you know, get dragged to Washington to deal with all this nonsense? Well, hang on, Jason. You you think Larry and Sergey are playing puppet master? I feel like they've really departed mm -hmm. the scene. Uh, my understanding is that they put Sundar in charge. He does make the decisions, but ultimately, you know, they they have a lot of voting say in all of this, and yeah. put, you know, basically putting themselves up into the executive chair positions was a way to not get dragged to Washington and creating the yeah. Alphabet Group was a way to also obscurify that. And so that is the deep insider track of like, how do we, because, you know, Zuckerberg can't do that, right? Uh, if right. they want, Zuckerberg tried to send people to Washington or to- They want him, you know, yeah. The UK, and they're like, yeah, no, you're the CEO, get your ass over here. Now, who's going to show up when they want to put Amazon, you know, uh, right. or Microsoft? It's, the CEO has to go, right. period. Chairman, and, and have I to do go. think- yeah, and I do think, you know, when Jeff is there, he's not just there as the as the CEO of Amazon, he sits there as the richest guy in the world. And that's yeah. a stigma, right? And and Andy presents a humbler, uh, safer target. Um, I think he'll he'll represent the the company well. Um, I, I do though think it's ge that gen genuinely Jeff has moved on to uh. even even to an extent that I didn't really understand early on but but sort of saw when i when i went to van horn the way he talked about blue origin and its philanthropic initiatives um and not amazon i feel like this is now andy jazzy's company hmm. um but to, to address you yeah to address your first question you know when 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 the when the, when a judge sent the ftc's case against facebook back and said that it had to re remake its argument about market definition i saw that as the possible outcome in the case against amazon it's that it's going to be very difficult for lena khan and her colleagues to make a case that this is a monopoly because amazon you know is a is a relatively you know big fish but in a the giant ocean of retail with significant competitors like Walmart and, in, and enterprise computing competes against Microsoft and Google. Um, Not in significant yeah. competitors is what yeah. you're saying. Right, so how do right. you say it's a monopoly if you've got Walmart that's, right. that's bigger and you've, you're up against Google, IBM and Microsoft right. for Amazon Web Services? It makes no sense. 
Right. Now, I do think that we're going to see we're going to see cases and we're probably going to see Amazon retreating and and funny, the the same way Apple has a little bit on the App Store on on small things, the relationship Mm. that Amazon has with its sellers, most favored nation price pricing schemes, um, you know, retreats in behavior that maybe made sense in 2005, but doesn't does it in 2021. But in terms of the specter of, you know, the wand waving and uh, existential end to the company known as Amazon, because they're found to be a monopoly and broken up, you know, that that Microsoft wasn't broken up and it was a monopoly in the late 90s. So I, I see it as a, yeah, as a as a very unlikely outcome for Amazon. See, this is the interesting part. You have the AOCs of the world, you know, Amazon's the worst thing. We have to stop them with that. I, d- I don't think actually understanding the law here. Uh, no, I'm not single out AOC, but just the, the sort of whole cohort there of young, anti-corporate, anti-large company, you know, politicians. Um, and I'm not sure if Lena Khan actually falls into that. And I haven't met her or talked to her. Have you? I have. And, yep. what, what is, what is she like? What is her, you know, well, like um, I'm, I'm, driving I, I, force? Does yeah. she have a philosophy there, do you think? Yeah, yeah. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a valid one. And And I think one thing is, that she's listened, you know, she's mm-hmm. listened to uh, sellers on the Amazon marketplace. And she's listened to, uh, you know, to, to publishing houses who've been negotiating with Amazon for 20 years. And there are legitimate grievances. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, that these are monopolistic or anti competitive practices. But I think a lot of good points were raised in the, um, you know, Cicciolini's uh, uh, house committee that looked into Amazon and other tech companies. Um, you know, and it's a story we've seen before, you know, a company that scraps and fights for every inch of market power over the course of 10, 20 years, and then becomes dominant, but doesn't necessarily change its stripes. And I think See, we're, we're actually seeing, yeah. yeah, we're seeing Amazon start to reconcile, I think, I think some of that behavior, but they're not making it up. And I don't necessarily think it's like polemical, you know, Lena Khan has been doing this for a couple of years and she's listened to the very valid complaints that are out there yeah. that that Amazon, you know, wields a a big stick. I think you just nailed it. When you fight to get where you are, um you are a samurai, you're a fighter, you're a warrior, you're a gladiator, whatever it is. And then all of a sudden you become king or queen. And now you don't need to fight. But then you have sometimes these people who are wartime consigliers, they're wartime CEOs. And, and they, they can't stop themselves. And you saw that with Google where they just couldn't stop scraping people's data with the one box. So you and I are journalists, writers, and we have a web page and we get paid when people visit the web page. And then Google's like, you know what? We're gonna send you traffic. You know what? Uh, we're gonna put an abstract under here and oh no, we're gonna make you a one box or we're gonna put a question there and you can hit the drop down, and we'll pull the paragraph that you're actually looking for just to make it a little faster for you. And now you don't have to go to Bloomberg. We've experienced this from Google, yes? Absolutely. And and it's infuriating when you're Yelp or you're a journalist or a content producer that, and and I, you know, I told this to Sergey and I told this to the the Google folks. I was like, you guys, you've already won. Be magnanimous. We're making crumbs over here as journalists and as, you know, websites that are making content. Why do you need to dominate us so much? And, you know, Sergey's answer and other people's answer is always like, well, we're just trying to give the consumer an answer, which I understand. But be magnanimous in victory is something that the deranged machine that gets built when you start from zero, like you're saying, it's actually a really interesting way to look at it. I think, yeah, particularly when you're aware of the of the long history in Silicon Valley of being disrupted by by startups, and you're constantly digging your moat because you know that dominance or hegemony today doesn't mean anything tomorrow. It's it's interesting. It, it, we saw today at the time we we're taping this um, news broke that Apple and Epic. Apple lost the epic lawsuit in an epic way. Well, the, I I would argue they kind of the judge kind of split the apple, so to speak. But, okay, here we but, go. But you're right the 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 rules of the road hopefully will will change in the App Store. Um, so now there was a Apple had a very um, you know Apple is very friendly uh, when they're throwing the elbow in your face, and the elbow in the face with the App Store was you couldn't link out to let people sign up at your website. So you're the New York Times, you're you're Rupert Murdoch took offense to this, and he had a big blowout with Steve Jobs over it, when he wanted newspaper subscriptions. You know, you want to have the customer relationship. How do you not have the email of your customers? And Apple wants to obscurify that by you doing payments through the App Store. In fact, in the latest update, they let you say don't give my email. 
you know, get use a fake email. So they want to control that customer relationship. And they were just told by the judge, listen, you can't do that anymore. And you got to change this. And now that could be have a pretty serious hit. But it also I think takes them out of the crosshairs of antitrust because the legal system's working. Uh, and this is going to empower don't you think other groups of uh, startups to work together. Uh, it didn't work against Google like Yelp and a bunch of other people tried it with Google and search as I previously explained. it didn't work. But this just worked. You know, you had Epic and I guess Spotify and Netflix and other people were kind of joining this coalition. Th is this the future of, uh, you know, throttling these big companies? Well, look, I mean, what a a Apple stock is down two or two and a half percent today. It's, it's not like it's a death knell. <laughs> Apple's no, but be it's just a big fine. number. That's it's a big, big number. number. Yeah. But look, I mean, where I knit out is that hopefully this will be a better consumer experience because, you know, the number of times I had to respond to a parent uh, saying, you know, why can't I buy my Kindle book? The Amazon app on my iPad won't uh, let me. Or why can't I sign up for Netflix? It's, you know, I'm I'm here on the, on my iOS app. Um, and and it's it's because of a business dispute because none of these media companies wanted to pay the 30% toll. So in this new future, uh, you know, it's just going to simply be a better customer experience. You know, Netflix or Amazon or Spotify will own the relationship. They won't have any hesitancy, like, si you know, getting people to sign up on your iPhone or iPad. And I think consumers will will benefit. And I think Apple will be just fine. If you look at the the, the big fang companies, which one do you think is um, the most sharp elbow dangerous towards society? Uh, Facebook, Apple, Google, Amazon? <laughs> Like does that one that concerns you most that you think needs the most yeah. regulation has the most detrimental effect on society. Mm -hmm. it's a well, hard one to okay, think I'm not gonna. No, I'm I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna answer as a journalist. I'm gonna answer as a parent. Yes. Okay. Um, perfect. Um, Love it. I'm, I'm I I'm uncomfortable with TikTok. And and I just I, I have no visibility into what my kids are seeing. Um, you know, they they love it. Forget I mean, for, forget about Facebook being dominant or Instagram. You know, my kids, my my teenage girls uh, live in a TikTok world. And I don't have you know, I, I, I don't uh, I don't have I'm not being a great parent there because I don't know what is being fed to them because of their, yeah. their choices by by an algorithm that's been, you know, devised and is controlled by a, a Chinese company. Um, I, you know what? And there are some idiots out there who are going to say you're being xenophobic because they don't understand that it's a communist country that considers themselves a rival and that they need to dominate America. How can you dominate America if they had the data on all of our children and their programming of all of our children in an app that over sexualizes kids and exposes them to things that are bad for kids? Now, this sounds like a conspiracy theory. Oh, the Chinese government. And by the way, this. even are if it was an naive? American company, even if it was an yeah. American company, I'd have, I would have the same concerns. And yeah. and so, you know, it's it's uh, it's the lesson that we've learned over and over in, in Silicon Valley. It's, you know, the <laughs> dominance today doesn't mean anything tomorrow. And TikTok has almost come practically out of nowhere and is consuming my kids' lives. And sometimes yeah. I, I worry their childhoods because they yeah. spend a lot of time on it, may, particularly may during the pandemic. Just the, the age range here? Yeah, uh, about? teenage, three teenage girls. Yeah, so I have three teen, I have three daughters, one 11 and two five-year-olds, and they're not, they're not allowed on it yet, but I'm going to be having to deal with yeah. the issue you're dealing with, which is I got to be the parent who says you can't be on it, and then that empowers them to want to do well, it more. And by and the I've, way, I've looked at it. It is gnarly. The stuff on yeah. TikTok is gross. I mean, uh, some and portion but, of it. And it's I'll just really say, by, by the way, it's also turned them into creators. I mean, they, Which you know, positive, but uh, yeah. I don't know, you know, and, and that I am asserting myself and they do keep that stuff private. Um, mm. So there's some good to it, but yeah, a, a lot, a, a lot of it does worry me. Yeah. I mean, maybe, yeah. And, and let's, let's, there's a good pivot into China. Uh, man, we were sitting here during the Clinton era. Everybody's talking about, you know, and the Bush era, we're going to have these great relations with China. My Lord, they're, they're going to embrace commerce, they're going to become entrepreneurial, and there's going to become a democracy, and it's going to be beautiful, and we're going to do business together, therefore, we can't go to war. And in the last six months, it seems like, or since COVID, actually, seems like things, all gloves are off. You know, they, putting aside whatever happened with COVID, which looks really sketchy, whether you believe, it, you know, leak from a leg, but they didn't give us complete information. That's pretty obvious. And then now... Jack Ma disappears. They got 3 million Uyghurs in a concentration camp. They took over Hong Kong and rolled it. 
They've got people being reeducated, uh, and they're going to probably take over Taiwan, maybe, and they're delisting their companies, maybe the education companies. Well, I mean, what do you think of this uh, maelstrom of events in China? Yeah. Well, let's just say that Mark Zuckerberg's jog through smog-filled Tiananmen Square seems like it happened a long time ago. Back yeah. when <laughs> back when tech companies thought they could charm their way into the Chinese market. Yeah, I mean, they're most from. <laughs> The most remarkable thing to me is China's war against its own tech companies. And it, it's, it feels a little inexplicable because at one point, those were the national champions that represented China's business interests in Southeast Asia and India and, and, and elsewhere. And now they're curtailing them and saying that they can't expand and hurting their financial prospects in the West. And, you know, you have to conclude that the, the, the party, you know, looks at it as a threat to their control. Um, and um yeah it's it's just remarkable and these these stories i always enjoyed going to china once a year and interviewing um you know jack or pony ma or telling these um uh robin lee from baidu um uh, sh uh talk to the talk to the guys at xiaomi like these great entrepreneurial stories that felt like silicon valley in the 90s and you can't talk to them anymore. They won't talk wow. to us um, right now. And, 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 and they're muzzled and they're scared of saying the wrong thing. So it's a, you know, it's, this is a developing story and it's going to be really interesting to see where it nets what, out. What do you think happened with Jack Ma? What, what are, what are journalists who, you know, cause you know, people on the inside, you know, you have the back channels that maybe people are buzzing about, but haven't made it into the actual articles yet. What is the back channel buzz about what happened with Jack Ma? I mean, we know, he criticized them. He disappeared. Ant, you know, was crushed. Um, he's painting oil paintings. I don't know that Wall Street Journal <laughs> yeah, story. That's right. Well, I was like, he, hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That was a good story. He he had already taken a step back, and Daniel Zhang um, had taken over the company. Um, I I think you know he 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 was he is so flamboyant and just like you know enjoyed. He was a uh, being on the on the global business scene and talking. Um, and, and I think right now, all these guys have, have, I don't th necessarily think they're disappeared in any nefarious way, but they're staying quiet. They realize that you say the wrong thing and it has big business repercussions. Um, and so they're just kind of holding their fire and probably waiting to see if, uh, they can swing their own government back, uh, in their favor. And, and if you had to take a guess, you think that's going to happen? Or do you think that they're just going to nationalize all these giant companies? No, I, I actually think it will happen. Um, and I'm guessing, and I've got colleagues that know this a lot better than I do, but like it is in China's national interest to have strong tech companies, right? And to, you know, if they want to be a power player in these parts of the world where, you know, like Sing, like Singapore, or Southeast Asia or India, um, you have to take the gloves off and let these go companies go and operate and build their businesses and invest in companies and be active. And so, I just tend to think that like, yeah, these things seem to, again, I, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm not a Chinese expert, but they say they seem to go in waves. Right. And I, I feel like at some point, the company has to recognize that, you know, every, every, these companies from Didi to, to Alibaba and Tencent, that it's in the country's interest to let them operate. Feels to me like, I don't know if you remember when MBS put all the princes in the Ritz Carlton or the St. Regis or something. That's right. And he's like, yeah, let's let's talk about how things are going to work on a go forward basis. And it was kind of like a grand renegotiation. And Jack Ma, I think people in the West knew a lot more about Jack Ma than Xi Jinping, right? And I think he's probably much more popular. And that can't sit well with somebody who's got a hundred year plan and is the dictator for life or ruler for life, you know, to have somebody more popular and wealthier and, and you know the west has embraced i mean that that seems to me like the straight line if we go back to the straight line theory uh what happens <laughs> to uh, uh oh god i was yeah. gonna say i'm not gonna comment on that one you you may not <laughs> want to go back to china but i might one day <laughs> it is you know that's one of the crazy issues you think about us as americans you know daryl morey just you know uh you know gm for at the time the rockets makes a, just a just very simple sign of support for the people of Hong Kong, who just want to maintain some level of freedom that they had, you know, uh, you know, for the past couple of decades. A and 
everybody in the NBA, you know, throws him under the bus. A and for what the 10% of incremental dollars they get from China, and then people in Hollywood, who are the most highest virtue signaling uh, folks, they're changing the ends of movies because they can't um, sell them in China. And literally, China's picking the ending of movies. You can't. The reason they said there's so many terrorists as, you know, uh, as uh, uh, villains in movies now is because you can't have a Chinese person as a villain. Uh, I don't know if you remember, like, uh, that was like one of the core James Bond movies, you know, there was a, a Chinese villain, you know, this type of villain, that type of villain. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on American companies <laughs> not being, I mean, I don't want to screw up your book deals turning into <laughs> movies now, but I'm scorched earth, Brad, I don't care. <laughs> but I mean, just what do you think about how the West should um, embrace an authoritarian country with products? It's hard, right? Hollywood and the NBA. Mm hmm. It's interesting. I mean, I haven't thought a lot about it. Um, yeah, the NBA, obviously, China, NBA cultivated the Chinese market for, for so long. And so, yep. you know, you could see like, it, well, it's in, it, it was interesting. I mean, the react, it wasn't as much a cultural reaction as it was like a protective business reaction. And yeah. Hollywood, right? The one of the measures of success right now is can the can the movie launch in China? And the, the new Marvel movie, Shang-Chi, apparently is not, but the James Bond movie will. And um, mm. so, right, it's like, these are business realities. And, but, and you're, yeah. you're raising the question, of, well, what's the right thing to do? Or what's the, yeah. the culturally Western or American thing to do? And, but as you know, it's like, these are big multinational companies who's, yeah. you know, who, and, and it's the almighty bottom line. And so and I guess, you know, without passing judgment, I'll say it's sort of not surprising, right? That they're yeah. making business decisions and maybe self-censoring a little bit. Yeah. I'll, and I'll, I will pass judgment. You're cowards. You can't get up there <laughs> at the Oscars and make all these speeches, uh, you know, about this group that's being, you know, that's suffering in America, or the cops are terrible in America, or this group's terrible in America, or Black Lives Matter, or Amazon workers, and then they got 3 million Uyghurs in concentration camps. Sorry, you can't have it both ways, Hollywood or the NBA. If you're going to fight for injustice, you fight for injustice wherever it sits. And if you let the chips fall where they may, and if you're a LeBron James, and you're a billionaire, and now you're only worth 900 million, who cares? You know, and if they don't want our books in the future. Who cares? Like, you know, I, my books in 11 languages, if it's going to be in 10, I don't care. You know, like, it's not worth it. Uh, you know, for me, what, what do you think about this Elizabeth Holmes thing as we wrap here? Got any thoughts on Elizabeth Holmes? I mean, it wasn't backed by Silicon Valley venture capitalists, but it, yeah, it right. certainly is a weird situation. I mean, I it, it's uh, um, it's a fascinating story. I am watching the, the the court drama along with everyone else. I personally haven't covered it. Um, yeah. Bloomberg's done a great job of covering it. Um, you know, I I don't know, I don't know. Um, yeah. I, I guess you know, I, I am sort of curious, like why the case ha re has resonated so much, right? Like, what about mm. her? has drawn so much attention and is there an element of wanting to you know i mean it was a fraud of course it was a fraud but like yes it does it partly resonate because she was a powerful female ceo yeah what, what people role does gender play down? yeah yeah and have people been really like sort of taking some weird pleasure in the extent of her downfall um i don't know but but look i mean i think um, it's an interesting yeah. insight and th there's yeah. a there's a counter to that which is also She's using uh, that she was a, you know, uh, had the Shvengali now uh, and that she was, you know, had Stockholm syndrome. And that's why she lied and committed this fraud for 20 years. Right. It's, right. You know, it's, no, what a it's, mess of like trying to two two guys trying to <laughs> pass judgment on this situation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, somewhere out there, there's a, a picture. master manipulator. You know, John oh, yeah. Kerry said, like, don't underestimate her. Yeah, somewhere out there, there's a, a two minute or so clip of Emily Chang and I on Bloomberg television interviewing her. And I just oh, think wow. that we never we, we Bloomberg in a business week, we never got upside down and put her on the cover in the way that some other magazines did. But yeah. I remember, you know, sitting there interviewing her and, and, you know, I don't know that my spidey sense was tingling, but not quite understanding exactly where she was coming from at the time. See, that's, that's a very interesting observation, because a lot of the people I talk to who are investors, you know, journalism and investing is the same thing. I always tell people that's why Moritz, myself, you know, other folks we know, you know, made that jump, oh, Malik, etc. Because um, you, 
are tr you have partial information. Your only weapon, really, your only tool is asking questions and finding more people to ask questions to, listening to the answers, and then trying to figure out the great mystery of what is right. Theranos. And the journalist is just trying to convey what Theranos is to the audience. As an investor, you're just trying to convey to yourself, is this worth placing a bet on? But you're just trying to find the, the, the truth. Uh, and with her, you just couldn't understand what she was talking about or find the truth. And when you know this, when you're talking to a subject and they can't just explain it to you in plain English, right. you know, and, and, and there's a or, lot of questions. Warning sign. The, the red flags just built up with that company over and over again. I had one investor, you know, prominent who laughed in her face because he asked to see the machine and she said, we can't show you the machine. It, he was like, you're asking us for a hundred million dollars. He literally, she said, yeah, well, you can invest, but we can't show it to you. And she just literally laughed in her face and left the room and told myself and a couple of friends, like, wow, that woman's a fraud <laughs> before it came out <laughs> like crazy. All right, listen, everybody, drop what you're doing, take a pause, go over to the app store. And uh, I don't know if you're going to be able to buy the book. You may have to go to a web browser still. If you're on an iOS device, go to your local, go to your local bookstore, oh, local bookstore and buy even better. Yes. Amazon Unbound. And Jeff Bezos while you're at it, get the collection, the end, get the trilogy, right. get the upstarts, get the everything store. And th As an awesome. entrepreneur, read these because there's so many lessons in them. We just scratched the surface. Brad, you've been great giving us an hour of time. I truly appreciate it. I'm going to let you go for your great weekend um and policing tiktok and the other things we both have to deal with well i hope we can go uh get some ramen or something uh i'll talk to you soon brother that'd be great and bye. we'll see you next time on this week in startups bye bye